This is Fresh Tracks Weekly, where we give you an update of what we got going on and basically what I've read in the news for the week. So, for us, on YouTube this week, the Arizona Archery Elk Hunt finished up. Uh, the last episode went up yesterday. It was a Sufferfest. Um, so if you want to enjoy a good Sufferfest, check out those videos. They're all up on YouTube now. But next week, be on the lookout for Bo Beatty's Colorado Deer Hunt along with Randy's New Mexico application strategy video. Over on the subscription platform though, we have a new episode of Anything Goes going up. Uh, it's about walleye and uh, kind of the culture surrounding it. We, we have a in really interesting case study uh, that is Randy Newberg, super, super dedicated walleye angler. So yeah, it was a really, really fun episode to make. So uh, if you have time and you're a subscriber, check it out. I have been playing catch up on some old episodes of From the Backburner with Jonathan O'Dell. Um, super interesting podcast that Randy's been helping him. He's helping produce it. Uh, Jonathan is just an amazing conversationalist and he has some super interesting guests. They've talked about everything from small game hunting and conservation, wild game cooking, culture. Um, Jonathan breaks things down really well. It's been a bit of a whirlwind since last week. Randy was in Portland for the Pacific Northwest Sports Show. Uh, he was able to get out on the river with Matthew for a little bit and they went sturgeon fishing. I saw some pictures and video of that. It looked pretty awesome. They got to watch a, a giant sea lion eat a sturgeon right next to the boat. Uh, so that's crazy. Um, back in Montana, Michael was on the hard water ice fishing. He had to play with his new new drone, um, got some cool shots there. Um, and uh, I was on vacation actually. I was down in Arizona with my wife Kara and some of our friends and we were chasing javelina. Um, hunting them with a rifle this time. We've done the archery in the past but chased them with a rifle and it was a lot tougher than I thought. Uh, we struggled to find them. The grass was super tall and it was, just a, it was a struggle. We, we got into them though, we got a few, so that was a good time, but mostly it was just good to hang out in the desert uh, with some of my friends who had never been there before. Just good friends, good food, good places. Um, yeah, and uh, of course you had to cook up some some uh, backstrap from the javelina and then uh, make Hank Shaw's Pozzoli Verde. When I think of javelina, I think of Hank Shaw's Pozzoli Verde. I got back to Montana just in time for Jay Spear to cook up some black bear from his berry shot last spring. Uh, he made a meatloaf. He mixed in some pork chorizo and made this meatloaf and mashed potatoes. It's probably the best meatloaf I've ever had. It's super good. Um, so thank you, Jay Spear. I really appreciate that. We're going to jump into some headlines. I want to remind everyone, I am not a journalist. I am not a politician. I'm not a scientist. What I am is minimally educated uh, in fish and wildlife and documentary film. Other than that, I don't know that much. It's uh, <laughs> So just take everything I say with a grain of salt. I'm pretty uneducated on a lot of this stuff. The thing that uh, I often find myself doing is reading, uh, maybe it's like a wildlife journal article or just a news article, watching a commission meeting and sitting through that and then at the end of it, I still don't really know what's going on. And I'll have to reread it or listen to it again. And uh, I, I kind of struggle to understand like what was said, what were the implications of it? Um, so I find myself uh, rereading, re-listening all the time, and uh, I, just ha I have a simple mind, so I have to boil it down into like a very uh, basic formula of what do these people want, and what do those people want, and why do they want it? And so, you know, that sometimes there's two sides to an issue, sometimes there's more than two sides. I'm just trying to look at all sides and understand exactly what's going on. I find that very, uh, most often nobody wants to be the bad guy. Nobody goes into something being like, oh, I'm gonna be super malicious about this and I want to I want to be the bad guy in this situation. No, no, everybody thinks that they're the good guy. And so knowing that and trying to understand where people come from, with this, I'm trying to look at both sides and try to understand everything. Uh, and of course, I'm still gonna have opinions. Uh, with that said, I'm rambling. We're gonna jump into some headlines. From some stuff we talked about last week in California, they had that commission meeting. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife met and discussed that petition 2021-027, which was to eliminate an open hunting season for black bear until the department's bear management plan is updated. They received a ton of public comments on this. There was a lot of people in that meeting that were, were commenting on both sides of it. Uh, those in favor of the petition are demanding the closure until the management plan is completed, basically wanting to have a better grasp on the population um, and in the meantime, they want to completely shut down the hunting season. On the other side, people think that that's a vast overreaction. A lot of people either wish to deny the petition or refer it to review 
to the uh, department, um, which is what it, the commission unanimously ended up doing. They referred it to the department, so now my interpretation of that is I think that the, the biologists, the, the department are gonna review it and uh, come up with a plan and recommendation. And uh, Director Chuck Bonham said that they will have an update and a review and recommendations by the April meeting. So we'll have to revisit this, keep an eye on it, see what happens in April. Um, yeah, it was, it was really interesting to listen to the to some of that commission meeting and you just, the dynamics are completely different state to state and what stakeholders are involved and who's calling in for public comment. Um, yeah, this is a new, relatively new realm for me. So I'm trying to grasp all this and understand it, but it's pretty interesting to, to just listen to the process. In Mississippi, State Senator Charles Younger is considering introducing legislation to sell the Black Prairie Wildlife Management Area back into private hands. Currently, the WMA is open to the public and open to hunting. Younger, his reasoning is quoted in saying, quote, I am all for the public having a place to hunt, but they need to lease the land and have their biologists run it in a way that there's taxes being paid on it. In my area, there's 6,000 acres of the Black Prairie WMA, and I think it's kind of ridiculous. End quote. Younger also claimed that there are structures that are not used on the WMA, including a house. In response, Mississippi's Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks Chief of Staff, Russ Walsh, said that the house is their WMA headquarters and it's used all the time. He continued to explain that hunters, fishermen, wildlife watchers do contribute to the local economy and that if they had to lease the land, it would cause a host of problems, um, basically not being able to control the habitat, what happens to the timber, what happens to the land. Uh, it would it'd handicap their ability to manage it. Uh, multiple wildlife groups have come out in opposition to this legislation and are urging the public to comment on the issue by submitting contents to the Londes County, Lon, Lowndes? I don't know, I'm probably saying that wrong, Lowndes County, which can be sent to this email address right there. So in Wyoming, sagegrass farms were temporarily allowed five years ago, uh, in which a private company, Diamond Wings Upland Game Birds, was allowed to collect and hatch wild sage-grouse eggs. The Wyoming legislature introduced Senate File 61, which would essentially get rid of the temporary part of this and allow sage-grouse farms to continue to collect wild eggs and propagate sage-grouse. Um, the reason that this is all uh, happening, if you're unaware, sage-grouse have seen massive declines in the last 60 years mostly due to loss of habitat or destruction of habitat in various forms. Basically, sage grouse need intact sagebrush landscapes, and we've got rid of a lot of those. Those in favor of allowing sage grouse farming uh, continue to argue that they're just figuring out how to successfully propagate sage grouse and how this process could help put more sage grouse out onto the landscape. Those in opposition to this argue that this isn't solving the root of the problem, which is habitat loss and degradation. They're arguing that it's a distraction from the real problems, saying where the habitat is in good shape, the sage grouse are doing well, but where the, where the habitat is in poor shape, that's where the sage grouse are struggling. So uh, I was a sage grouse tech for three years, so I'm gonna weigh in a little bit with my opinion. Um, I think that putting farm sage grouse out onto the landscape in poor habitat, which is where they need more numbers of sage grouse in theory, that's equivalent, and I'm gonna use a simple analogy here because uh, I have a simple mind. I think that would be similar to taking hatchery raised fish and throwing them in a puddle that's maybe 100 yards from the river and then going, look, problem fixed, now we have more fish. You're, you're ignoring the root of the problem. In Washington, the Department of Fish and Wildlife Commission is meeting today, February 25th, in which they will hear a petition to ban baiting for deer and elk uh, due to concerns of CWD. Currently, CWD has not been detected in Washington, but the petitioner is worried that if it does take hold in the state, if CWD takes hold in the state, that it'll further, further the problem. So there's very little news on this, and I, I assume that's due to the fact that the staff recommendation to the commission is to deny this petition claiming that they want to have more time to work on their Humans Dimension Group and their CWD management plan before doing any significant rule changes. Basically, they want to talk to the stakeholders and understand the implications before doing any drastic regulation changes. Uh, so that likely won't go through. But the reason I bring it up is because CWD is spreading and we are hearing more and more about it and how it's affecting regulation changes, how it's affecting the, the deer herds themselves. And I think we're going to continue to have more issues, more regulation changes, so that's this week's deeper dive. We're gonna get Randy and we're gonna we're gonna talk about it. CWD. 
chronic wasting disease. Chronic wasting disease markers. I, I'm probably going to be the first human known where CWD jumps from ungulates to human. You're going to be patient zero of the zombie apocalypse. Maybe. Something like that. And I, I'm going to confess, I've never had an animal tested, and I, I've hunted in CWD area. <laughs> Now, it was not a requirement, and mm -hmm. I didn't even know where to get it voluntarily tested, but I ate it anyhow. So there's a decent chance that you've consumed a deer that had CWD or an elk. Yeah. Yeah, I feel and like now I'm, the, I'm pretty the, sure the audience is yeah. all going to say, well, <laughs> if Newberg is the <laughs> patient zero, I don't want to be like him. Yeah. Um, Before we get too far along, I got to say that when I was researching this, uh -huh. I have to give Jim Heffelfinger credit because. He's where I got a lot of the information from. No, he's, Jim, he's very good at keeping us informed and keeping us, uh, yeah, yeah, just well informed on current issues within anything, especially deer. But yeah. like just wildlife biology in general, for sure. That's he's, why uh, they call him Jim Deer, right? Jim Deer or the Deer Nut. He's got all sorts it, of yeah. deer pun pun yeah, names. Yeah. I'm glad but, that yeah. he puts up with our questions all the time. Yeah, and he actually he has a really good like. There's a ton of scientific literature that. He's sent out, and there's good papers and everything, but if you want a good summary, his uh, Mule Deer Foundation magazine article on CWD was a good like summary of everything. I found that cool. pretty interesting. I also wanted to give a disclaimer at the beginning of this because I've been an art student much more recently <laughs> than I've been a wildlife student. And Randy's a, an I'm accountant. I'm a tax accountant. So, so what, like, what take, are we doing talking take about CWD? Everything that we say, take with a grain of salt, for yeah, sure. Call, like, call Heffelfinger, the CDC, or some scientist. Or just, yeah, exactly. Don't, but, yeah. but I did a podcast with two absolute ex experts from Michigan and, and New York yeah. on this. So what episode? How long ago? So you can reference it. That was so uh, three years ago. Um, right. we'll, put a, we'll put a screenshot of the episode number. Yeah. Check it out. Yeah, if you haven't heard about CWD, you've probably been living under a rock. If, it's if been you're in, uh, yeah. in a lot of news, a lot of topics recently. How many states is it in now? Uh, according to the article I just read, it's 26 states, three Canadian oh. provinces. I thought it'd be more than 26. Is that just because some of them aren't? It testing? might be more. Did who just got re Idaho. Idaho recently? So that might be the 27th. I should look at the okay. dates. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot. Yeah. And then we'll put up a distribution map. Okay. That kind of shows uh, where it's all at. Uh, yeah. It's so what? What? Spreading. Tell me, because I've tried to consume as much information as I can about CWD with by consuming as little meat <laughs> related to CWD. Yeah. What? What's kind of the status right now? I mean, we, there are some people I think who specifically want to discredit anyone who says CWD is an issue. And I don't know their motivation, but we see a lot of that out there. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, is it has been around for a while. Yeah. A like, so time. I think it was, yeah, in the 60s, like people are starting to identify it. And so it's mm -hmm. been around for a long time. We've known it's here, but it, I think the, the big thing is in the last few years, we've started to know whether it's been, however long it's been there or not, it's becoming more of an issue because it's the, the percentage in populations that have had it is increasing. So more mm -hmm. animals in a given population have it right. and then just geographically spreading. Right. And so, and then what does that mean? It's like, well, the more, the more areas that, if you get above a certain percent, the population is going to start declining. Like right. that's what the science is telling us. So, and that's what I think they said around 20%, if 20% of the individuals are infected, then the population is going to start to decrease. Wow. And so I think, from what I could see, at least Colorado, they're like aiming to stick around 5%, or they want to keep it under 5% prevalence right. in areas that they know have it. Mm -hmm. So, um, Which is most of Colorado. Colorado, <laughs> yeah, Wyoming. look at the map. It's like Colorado, Wyoming are pretty big hotspots. Yeah. Wisconsin's a pretty big hotspot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's spreading. And um, yeah. So um, uh, there's... That, like when we go and we do our trips on the road, we bring a pot to actually boil skulls because one of the mechanisms that right. the scientists tell us is transporting brain or spinal material 
two places where it's right. not. Yeah. So, well, let's back up even and okay. say like how. So how like how is it spread? Because that's right. like the the root of why they put those regulations in right. place, right? So it's spread through the, these prions, prions, whatever you want to call them. It's mm -hmm. this these things that can persist in deer urine and deer poop, saliva, mm -hmm. and then it, they found it living in the. All right, I guess living's probably not the right word, but persisting in the soil for like two to three years. Yeah. And, but then also, yeah, like you were saying, now they've put these regulations in place. Mostly related to brain matter, matter and spinal tissue. Right. Is that? Yeah, 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 for sure. And like that's the basic, prevalent. basically I'm, I'm sure that those prions exist in that, in that stuff. And so there's a lot of evidence supporting that hunters moving around carcasses has led to spread of CWD because mm -hmm. they're dumping carcasses and it, whatever, however, another deer comes in contact with that and gets CWD, mm -hmm. it spreads that way. So states have been proactive about putting bans in place of transporting carcasses across state lines. Basically, you don't want to take an infected deer and move it to an uninfected area, right. therefore, you know, spreading it. So it's, I think part of the rub becomes that we're in, I would say, is it safe? To, this is what I'm going to say. You tell me if I'm right. We're almost in the, still in the infancy of the science as it applies to what management mechanisms we have available to us to even control it. Yeah, I suppose. I mean, I think people have been talking about it for a while, but it, it's right. definitely coming up. Like, more so, yeah, what, can, what changes can we actually do to slow, to slow the spread? And right. so that was like an obvious one for some people is like, well, actually moving the infected carcasses. Let's not do that like yeah. that's a pretty easy thing to do that's <laughs> do yeah. first rule is always don't do anything worse <laughs> yeah so let's not move those around um but yeah uh the other thing that people that so the new management i feel like that's being proposed in a lot of areas right. and it's it was responsible for some of the regulation changes we just saw in montana right as, uh, like, uh, as far as mule deer regulations primarily i guess mm -hmm. uh is there's a lot of evidence saying that keeping deer numbers lower right. and keeping the age class lower is going to slow the spread of the disease. Yeah. And so as yeah. hunters, uh, as, uh, you so don't like the idea of seeing less deer and less big bucks on the landscape. Well, I, I, this is why I didn't wear a hat today. Is I, I knew, when I saw the outline, I'm like, look, I got to show the world. I'm a gray haired old fart who comes from the old school world that health of a herd is dictated by diverse age class. And now we get information that says to manage for CWD, having those older deer might not be the best thing. And so I'm just going to admit I'm struggling with this. I, I'm not, like you said, I'm an accountant. So well, I'm, I think, yeah, and, well, and the immediate response, I think, from a lot of people, the gut reaction is, like, okay, so if that's true, if that, if maybe we should liberalize harvest, we should kill more big bucks. And people will say, well, we've been doing that in Montana for years. And we have. So, but my question is, if we had it, what, would the landscape look different? Would it look worse? Maybe. I don't know. That's what some of the literature is telling us. That's a good, so, I never thought about it that way. Yeah. I, I mean, but yeah, I don't know. Who knows? But I'm a hypocrite myself because I was an advocate. I typed my public comment advocating to not, I wanted my mature bucks and an area that I was interested in, I was, you know, trying to keep that yeah. that I mean, regulation, uh, you know, limited permit to have higher age class bucks. So I'm myself, I'm a hypocrite. I'm like, you know, I, I think there's some good science there, but I, not in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I'm not here to discredit the science or say it's wrong. I'm I'm when you've done when you've approached all this with a certain mindset for your whole life. And now you got to sling that like 80 degrees left or 80 degrees this way. It's like, man, I just feel like I'm running in the ditch here. Give me some more. Tell, tell me what more tells me this is the path. Right. Yeah. And, and I think it'll be really hard. interesting to see. I think that, and I think managers are starting to, to do this implement, you know, basically mm -hmm. encouraging. That's what they did in Idaho this winter. This, yeah. Lowering the high age class bucks. See if, but I think it'll be really interesting to see if that has an effect. And I don't know, it's hard because like it's probably more effective if you do it at a landscape level. Right. 
and that's what people don't want to hear. And then if it doesn't work, so you do that for 10 years and it didn't work. and Everyone's and, mad. It's yeah, like, I, I just, ah, you know. I don't know. So it's, it's an interesting topic for sure. But yeah. uh, you can't deny that some of the research is, is saying that. Do, have you found it when you were prepping for this uh, session here? Some of the Midwest, Midwest states say one of the contributing factors that their license sales are going down are people's fear of CWD. And I, I joked about it at right. the opening that I'm going to be patient zero because I've eaten Wyoming out, Colorado meal deer that were from endemic areas. Right. So. It, the, is there any evidence? Have they surveyed any people to say, is CWD part of why you didn't hunt this? It, probably, and I didn't, I haven't found, I guess I didn't look at that before this, but I mean, theoretically, it is possible that it could jump from deer to humans. And so that like some of their fear is probably founded. Mm -hmm. It hasn't happened though. Like it right. has not happened yet. Right. Doesn't mean it can't. Right. And if it does, it's probably gonna have some pretty significant changes in I mean, this disease is 100% fatal. Like, if you get it, right. you're, you're dead. You're like, the deer die within two to three years if they get it. Like, mm -hmm. there's, so if it made that jump, it's, uh, that's going to be some big news if it ever happens. Yeah. So, because I don't know. Because you but, think of at least what they know of how transmission occurs. If it jumps to me, and I'm patient zero, you're not going to be someone who wants to have been as close contact with me as these deer have been with each other yeah. where it now we've just scared the hell out of everybody <laughs> but uh oh, it'll be interesting to see hopefully it never happens but yeah it, yeah good it so, could and i think i think there's definitely people that are terrified of it mm -hmm. like my mom is terrified of cwd like, oh really they always get their gear uh, yeah. tested and she won't eat it until we know for sure kim, kim is the same way so my yeah wife. So it, it sounds it, scary. Chronic wasting disease. Yeah. I mean, I guess it is scary. If you get it, you're going to die. So, but. so uh, where, where do we go from here? Do we even know? I don't know. I think in my mind, if it'll be interesting to see if they do some of these landscape management decisions with, and I'm going back to like hunters as manage as a management tool. Mm -hmm. So not as much as the meat thing anymore, but, uh, if managers are doing that, we lower these mature buck levels, have fewer deer on the landscape. Does that actually, is that the best thing for the deer herd? Does mm -hmm. it keep stable populations? It keeps them from declining. I mean, I think it's like you look at it as a in long-term investment. It's like, while it sucks, while we might be, you know, sad in the meantime, we don't get to shoot our big bucks for the long-term benefit of the herd. Mm -hmm. Is that the best thing for it? And a lot of things are pointing towards yes. But it'll be interesting to see. I think that just by the way the world works, some managers won't do that. They're right. going to still manage for trophy class bucks. Mm -hmm. And if it, CWD becomes a big issue there, it'll be interesting to have these case studies of one path and the other path yeah. and see what's actually effective. I, I and I mean, don't, we, don't, we won't know for a while. But no, it's not like you're going to go and do, conduct a study and have an A-B test and in a year you're going to have the results. I mean, these are long-term trends they're going to have to measure and take into all the other factors but oh right yeah are. this is just one of many things that affect deer populations yeah for sure but it also affects elk yeah caribou moose moose any yeah. of the cervids right yeah so white -tail, not, not white -tail and mule deer won't be in pronghorn won't be in or at least yeah no it's the cervids that's the issue for right, right now, now. Yeah, we know about right. it, so. Yeah, well, all the reason for me to eat more pronghorn, man. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's, I kinda, we kind of jumped around. I got all my talking points. We definitely uh oh, I'm sorry to mess you up. Oh, no, 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 I like this. I like uh, just having a, a conversation the, as the, it flows. But. The, to the audience, when Marcus invites me to sit in on these sessions, he does so at his own risk because I don't know how to follow a script. He spends all this time researching and scripting, and I'm. Oh, no, just, no, it's not a script as much as it is well, just like a. But it's just to outline. remind me to an talk outline. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like over here, and then I'm going to talk about the Super Bowl, and then I'm going to talk about my tag application <laughs> next month, and, and Marcus is trying to talk about CWD. Well, if I don't have my notes, I'll just stare blankly into space and forget what I was supposed to talk about. <laughs> so. 
Um, but no, it'll be interesting so, to see. I think uh, I think the future is going to tell us a lot. Like, and mm-hmm. hopefully we'll have different case studies to see what works. Yeah. Um, I, for me, it comes down to this is important enough that we got to pay attention. Yeah. It's going to cause managers to have to make some really tough decisions that we as hunters may not like. Right. But it's going to follow the path of science-based decisions. And it's going to affect how agencies do their work related to advocating for hunting, keeping hunters there, what's it going to do for their licensing. And then you start getting into a whole bunch of other things. You know, you haven't even touched on these private herds of... Right. Well, high that, fence breeder operations, all yeah, that, that stuff has been a source for some of this for sure. Yeah. The the the, the captive deer industry, yeah. So not not great for disease transmission and and potential well, spread into right. wild. No, not th- great to have on the landscape. No, no, no. It, it's a known vector. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's not, I I'm not well versed in like what every state's rules and laws are Mm -hmm. but i know that some people have been proactive about double fencing and all that but like yeah it's still like uh you know i'm right now pretty big advocate of just no captive deer farms montana got rid of them that was that was nice but i'm there with you but i guess as a hunter if you for me because I was out there advocating, like you were saying, I want a diverse age class. All my comments to the Montana two-year season setting process were, I want better age class. I don't, I'm not talking just because of antlers. I'm talking about all the data that has supported diversity of age class helps ungulate. Right. Well, then this, you, you send me this stuff like, hey, Randy, have you read this as you're advocating for older age <laughs> class? I'm like, yeah, I read it, but I don't like it. Yeah. Well, then it kind of comes down to like defining what is a healthy population. Mm -hmm. I think that some of the definitions of that is also a gray area. Yeah. And it's like, well, maybe it'll be healthy for 10 years, but then it's just going to slowly start to decline and you're never going to be able to pull out of that spiral downward. Who knows? But um, so here's what I would think would really be helpful to, to people like me is when you do one of these, you have Heffelfinger when he's in town. Oh, I know. Have Jim sit down here. I mean, it'll be a it long would, session. It would be great. But it would be so factual and so scientific that the audience would want to be taking notes. For sure. Versus a tax account. And they're just wondering if I if they can deduct something on their tax return by April yeah. 15th. Yeah, we're not the, I mean, realistically, we're not the right people to have these conversations, but here we are. No, we are. Uh, I but, think we are because I think we're <laughs> the average hunter who's. Yeah, hopefully, I guess we could be a this. link between, you know, the, down the chain of science, like why, why these managers and scientists are making the decisions yeah. that they are and try to communicate that, I guess, in a more palatable way. But mm-hmm. check out that um, podcast yeah. to dive a lot deeper into it. Yeah. These two, they, they are both such experts. They both hunt. Mm-hmm. I mean, their PhDs have been in wildlife disease, wildlife, you know, disease ecology. And the, the last, the, the, their message was, don't stop hunting because of CWD. Right. And so, don't stop hunting because of CWD. That's my message now too. But I'll I'll pull that up for well, you. And a lot of states you can you can get your deer tested or your elk or whatever, and they'll let you know if it has it or not too. And mm-hmm. they like a lot of in a lot of cases they want more samples, right. especially in certain areas. So yeah, you have can you, be helping out the the have, the science by submitting your lymph yep. nodes for testing. There's some good videos of. How to extract your lymph nodes and one of the struggles I have is when I try to remove the the lymph nodes. Mm-hmm. They're right next to the salivary glands. Yeah, they look similar. Yeah, yeah. So, that's why a good good YouTube video will yeah will point out the links we'll in the put description. A, put a link in there. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Marcus. I don't know what I've added to the discussion other than I'm that same person who's in my head trying to wrap my brain around the idea that some of these CWD management uh, policies are going to be a different path than what I've tried.
traveled for 57 years. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see how it, how it keeps going in the future, but it's just like, I guess, keep an eye on it and then just know that it's going to be impacting regulations in pretty much every state that has it. Yeah. Very likely. So. Very much. Thank you for watching or listening to Fresh Tracks Weekly. If you want to let me know of some issue in your state, what's going on, you can email me at weekly at freshtracks.tv. Uh, I now have a separate inbox so I can get all that and uh, see what's going on and, and uh, take your guys' consideration. I really appreciate any emails. Thank you for those of you who sent them last week. So with that, have a great day.